Hey, good morning, and welcome to Cornerstone at Home. We're so glad that you're worshiping with us wherever you are, in the city, around the country, around the world. We're gonna keep working through our series in Exodus today, but before we get there, I wanna invite you to church in person next week. On Sunday, March 7th, instead of being inside at 9 and 11, we're taking Cornerstone outside, one service at 10 a.m. So Sunday, March 7th, one service at 10 a.m. out in Arden Forest, which is the green space next to our parking lot. We're gonna worship together, we're gonna share communion, and we want you there. Now, if you're still worshiping online because of safety concerns, we totally respect that. But if you're comfortable being outside and six feet apart from people, we want to see your face. There's nothing like being together in person, so will you come? If you can make it, you can register at hpomc.org and register for Cornerstone outside. We can't wait to see you there. Now, Matt's going to be teaching us in Exodus, so grab your Bible, grab your Exodus book and a pen, and journey with us through the message. Okay, Cornerstone, it is good to be with you at home this week. Here's where we're going after this week. We're going after this jar. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If not, it's easy for you to catch up. Here's one of the things that I love about studying the Bible. One of the things I love is that you find that it's not just stories about things that happened a long time ago, but it is full of stories about things that are still happening. It's like the story of the Exodus, one of the central stories of the Bible that we've been looking at. It's the story of a group of people who are meant to be, who are meant to do something, but who are being held down by a force that is greater than them and being prevented to fully live out what it is that they're meant to be, they're meant to do. And the Exodus is the story of God getting them out, of God cracking the jar open, getting them out, and then dealing with the jar itself. Now look, I mean, you may already be able to see this. If not, we're definitely going to make it clear over the next few minutes. I mean, this isn't just a story of something that happened a long time ago. It's our story today. I can tell you, I got jars. I mean, I got jars of things that I know at times in my life have held me back from being fully who I'm meant to be. I got two jars right here with stuff on them that that I'm going to tell you about in my life. I, I've had things in my life, various habits or various, you know, hangups when it comes to the way that I think about myself or think about other people that have prevented me from being able to move forward. And I got a jar right here for you, okay? A jar where we're going to talk about you for a minute. So go ahead and be thinking about this. What is it that is preventing me from fully living into who it is that God might be calling me to be. The Exodus is not just the story of something that happened a long time ago. It's the story that's still unfolding in all of our lives today. So my hope today is that we're gonna be able to get deeper into this story. I want us to see it, understand it. And then my hope is that God will use this time to in some way crack open the lid of one of those jars in your life that through this story, that this week, you'll start to experience a little bit more freedom. Let me pray for us. Holy Spirit, we thank you. We thank you for this time that we have together. And we pray, Lord, that as we look at this story, that your spirit will just do something. That you'll help us to see clearly what it is that's holding us back, what it is that's not from you, that's preventing us from fully living into the things that you have for us. Help us to see what those things are. And Lord, do some work even this morning 
to start cracking those lids open. We love you and we thank you. We pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, let's talk about stories for just a minute. When you were a kid, what were some of your favorite stories? Was it like Charlotte's Web? Was it the, the Narnia books? What were some of your favorite stories? Right now, we're reading uh, the Nuffle Bunny series with our kids. There are three books. So I started reading those books to Sweet Mary Frances. She's three years old. She loves them. And I'll tell you, our boys are a little bit older. They've been sneaking in there also at night to hear about the Nuffle Bunny. I'm just telling you, they're good stories. But then what about today? Like for you, whether you're a, a teenager or an adult, what, what are some of your favorite stories today? We don't think about them this way, but of course the TV shows that we watch and the movies that we watch and obviously the books that we read, what, what these are are stories. You know, one of my favorite stories right now, I don't know if I've told you about this or not, is Cobra Kai, okay? I'm gonna double down on Cobra Kai. Not only do I think it's one of the best shows on TV right now, I think that Johnny Lawrence, one of the main characters, is one of, if not the best characters on TV right now. If you don't know who Johnny Lawrence is, you know who Johnny Lawrence is. He's the guy who gets kicked in the face at the end of the first Karate Kid movie, okay? This guy's back. And what I love about Cobra Kai is it's the story of him like discovering what his purpose is in life. Spoiler alert, it's to be a sensei, okay? I love this story. What, what are some of your favorite stories? One of the things that I'm beginning to, to realize in my life, really over the last half decade or so, is that the stories that I consume have a big impact on my life. I mean, it's like we think when we turn 18, all of a sudden we don't have to be careful what we watch anymore. They could be further from the truth. There are some stories that when I consume them, some TV shows, some movies, that lift my emotional health, and there are some that plummet my emotional health. There are some shows that if I watch them before bed, I go to bed feeling pretty good, pretty peaceful. There are others that raise my anxiety. And I've just decided I have enough real stuff to worry about than worry about somebody else's problems on a TV show day in and day out. The stories that we consume have an impact on our lives. It's just kind of the bottom line. One of the things that I'm beginning to realize is that the stories that I consume impact how I see and how I live out my story. I'm gonna say that again. The stories that I consume impact how I see and how I live out my own story. And what we've got here in the Exodus is we've got one of the greatest stories that's ever told. And it's a story that I think we do well to revisit. And it's a story that we do well to see our story of our lives through the lens of this story. Okay, to flesh this out a little bit more, let's just have a little bit of fun. Um, I have busted on romantic comedies before, but it's easy to do, so let's do it again. When you think about rom-coms, they're all the same movie, but look, look at this. You gotta see two things about these things. With any story, what's the problem and what's the solution? You see what I'm saying? Like, like what's the problem that's presented and then how is that problem solved by the end of the movie? Well, of course, in rom-coms, you've got somebody who is some kind of a miserable human being for whatever reason. There's some kind of a miserable human being. And then you figure out pretty quickly that what is holding them down, that what is preventing them from being a fully thriving human being is the fact that they're single, okay? This is like the story over and over and over again. And then what happens is that throughout the movie, they meet somebody, things go pretty well for a while, then things get really bad, and then things get really great at the end. And by the end, you know, they're out of the jar and they're living a fully self-actualized life and they're, they're great. So they start here, and they end up here. And what's the solution? Well, it's being in a relationship. And who's the hero? Well, the hero is almost inevitably like the prince or the princess, right? I mean, the person that comes into their lives and maybe it's, it's themselves to some degree also. But what gets you from here to here is um, like this, this romance. Well, look, what's the problem with this story? These stories are entertaining. Amy and I watch these things. They're funny sometimes. They're uplifting at times. Look, they're fine. The problem is when we don't see through the lie, that this is not the way that life actually works. The problem with these is that they are a fairy tale. They're not actually reality. They don't congrue with what we see in the real world. How do you know that? You know single people that are perfectly happy and you know married people that are perfectly miserable. Look, the problem with these stories is that they tell us things that just aren't actually true. Of course, part of the problem also is that you begin to believe some people that the jar, it's not your singleness, but it's, it's the person that you're with. And you start believing that lie, and I'll tell you, 
that can have catastrophic consequences on, on your family. Look, I don't want to bust on these things too much. Again, I watch them. But you can see how the stories that we consume influence the way that we see and the way that we live out our stories. You know, one of my favorite genres is like the, the coming of age genre. You get the same trajectory. You get somebody at the beginning who's kind of a miserable, you know, person. And what's the problem? Well, the problem is the man and the problem is definitely their parents and all, all of these things. And then they go on some kind of adventure, some kind of journey of self-discovery. And by the end, they know who they are and everything's fine. So the, you see the problem, they don't know who they are. The solution is discovering who they are and who's the hero. Well, the hero, of course, is, is themselves. But look, we just know that life doesn't actually work that way typically. And we look at our lives through the lens of that and we end up blowing all kinds of money to send our kids to, to hike around Europe. And we blow all kinds of money on self-help books. And look, it's fine to hike in Europe. That's great. If you're going there just because you think it's going to be fun, you should totally do that. You should go work with Indians or uh, with elephants in, uh, in India. Like you should, you, should, you should do that if you just simply think that it's going to be fun. But if you think that you need to do that in order to figure out who you are, the reality is, is that you can go to Glen Rose for a weekend and figure out who you are and see a bunch of cool animals. The reality is you don't have to go somewhere to find yourself. And the reality is that most of our trouble is not the fact that we don't know who we are. Here's the story of the Exodus. The story of the Exodus, a story that congrues more to the reality of what most of us are actually dealing with in our lives, is, is this story. You know what the problem is? I mean, it, this isn't a popular thing to say, but it, it's right there in the scripture and it's right there in my life. I think it is in your life too. You know what the problem is? The problem is sin. And here when I say sin, I don't mean like finger wagon stuff. I mean, when I say sin, I mean like a lack of congruence between the way that we live and the way that God has created us to live. I mean, it's when we put ourselves underneath the authority of other things and begin chasing after all kinds of things that don't actually lead to life, but that actually lead to destruction in our lives and in other people's lives. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about sin. That the problem in the Exodus story is the sin of Egypt and the sin of Pharaoh. Later, we'll get to the sin of the Israelites, but we're not there yet. It's the sin of, of Egypt and the sin of Pharaoh that believes that they are the Lord of other people's lives and keep people in slavery. And then what's the solution? I mean, in this, if we believe that the problem is human sin, it's us, us, us seeking things that, that actually lead to the detriment of ourselves and other people, then what, what's the solution? Well, here, I want to show you a little bit out of chapter 14 of Exodus. I'm just going to show you a few uh, verses today. Here, it, it presents right near the end of the story what the solution is in, in the Exodus story, in this story that I think that we should see our lives through. It's in chapter 14. It begins in verse 13. Fear not, this is Moses speaking. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. Where the Israelites have found themselves is that they, they've been broken free from Egypt. The, the lid has come off. But now they found themselves in a really tough spot because the Egyptians have come after them to put them back in the jar. They let them go, but then they, they changed their mind. No, 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 we actually want y'all back. And the Israelites find themselves up against the shore of a massive body of water. And on the other side is a massive army led by Pharaoh. And they don't know what to do. What's the solution? How, how do you get out of this mess? It's like the climax of a movie where you don't know how it's all going to unravel. And Moses says, look, don't fear, stand firm. The salvation of the Lord, see it, which will work for you today. The Egyptians who you see today, you'll never see again. You're never going to see that jar again. Let's watch. He's going to take care of the jar. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. Do you see what the solution is? The Lord will fight for you. That may be enough for us to hold on to for today. The Lord will fight for you. Have you prayed that before? Like, Lord, fight this battle for me. Go before me. I tend to trust Moses. I mean, when I read Exodus, I, I tend to trust that he knows what he's talking about. But here, God actually corrects Moses. Watch this. God actually corrects him. The Lord said to Moses, why, why do you cry out to me? Why, why, why are you crying out right now? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. You just told them to be quiet while I do my thing, okay? Yeah, you're right. I'm gonna do my thing. And you can trust me. I'm gonna fight this battle for you. But don't just stand there and be quiet. Go forward. And Moses 
Lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide the waters. Moses, get out there, put your hands up that the people of Israel may go through the sea onto dry land. Yeah, here's the deal, Moses. I am going to save you. The solution to the problem is me fighting this battle for you. But don't just stand there and be quiet. You get out there and participate in this work. You get out there and get your hands up. And you get out there and you tell the people to go on and march through it. The problem is human sin. Do you see what the solution is? The solution is indeed God fighting the battle, but it is also the people getting on board with God and following after him. Do you see this shift? It's people moving from underneath the authority of a false God in Pharaoh, living under the authority of some kind of lie and being moved to being underneath the authority of the God that they can trust. That's the story. It's the story of God saving the people and the people moving from believing the lie that Pharaoh is who they should trust to believing the truth that God is the one in whom they can put their trust. I mean, this ultimately is the story of the Exodus. And this is the story that that, that I see people, including myself, come more alive when I see my story through the lens of that story. It's not somebody else that's gonna get me up here. And it's not me that's gonna get me up here. It's God fighting these battles, but it's not me just sitting here being quiet. It's me seeking to be a part of this. Do you see this story? Okay, let me tell you a little bit about jars in my life. Here, here, well, so, okay, so, so Egypt first. Um, So God gets Israel out of Egypt, and that's great, but we talked about it. Then Egypt comes back and tries to get them back in the jar, right? But you, you see, you see what happens? I mean, some of you know this story. What, what, what happens next? Not only do they get freed from Egypt, but what does God do? God then collapses the sea around Egypt. I mean, Moses is right. They're never going to see Egypt again. You see, he doesn't want his people always living with fear that Egypt is over their shoulders. So he takes Egypt and he does away with it to set his people fully free from that thing that had once held them back. In my life, okay? Look, at some point, I began to think, you know, maybe speaking in front of other people is something that I could do. It was just a little seed that somebody planted after I gave a talk at an Eagle Scout ceremony. Just a little seed. But here's the problem. I was the most shy, awkward kid in my high school, bar none, okay? I, I, I was terrified of speaking in front of people and I was terrified of speaking to female people, okay? You put both of those things together, I probably can't speak in front of people uh, as, as like my calling in life, right? I, the, the night before, the summer before my senior year of college, okay? I have a presentation to do for my final in one of my classes. I'm presenting before 12 people and I don't sleep the night before because I am so worried about speaking in front of 12 people. Little do I know, eight, 10 weeks later, that summer, God begins to do things in my life where I come to know him in a new way and I begin to be sensed to, a sense of call to, to preach. I didn't work my way out of that. What God did is God pulled me out and I cooperated from under the burden of this shyness, this insecurity. And I'll tell you, for a while it lingered and then after a while, God just got just gone. And it doesn't mean that I'm not shy and awkward sometimes. Some of you know me personally. I am shy and awkward sometimes. But it does mean that it is so gone that it doesn't prevent me from living in to what God has called me to do. Look, what came on the heels of that is some self-righteousness. I mean, this sense that like somehow because of what God had done in my life that I knew better than other people and all of these things. And that was gonna prevent me from fully, what's written in here is, is being a disciple of Jesus. It took some hard work, some hard work from God and some participation from me to get to a place where, where that began to come out, where I truly began to see God as the hero of the story and me just as a participant in it. But I'm gonna tell you this, I'm not gonna throw this bottle in the bucket because that one still looks over my shoulder all the time, all the time. There's always the threat that I'm going back into that jug. 
back into that jar because that is a, a temptation that I think will stay with me for a really, really long time. But I'm praying that in time, God will completely get that out of my life also. I told you I had a jar for you. Here's your jar. What is it for you? I mean, what is it that you sense that God is like calling you to do or to be? But maybe even more importantly for, for this conversation, what's the jar? I mean, what is it that's holding you back? Is it some kind of habit that you've got? Maybe what you really desire is deeper intimacy with somebody, but you've got some kind of habit that's preventing that. Maybe they know about it, maybe they don't know about. And maybe it's time to let God deal with that habit and you cooperate with it. Look, some of that sin, man, it only comes out through God doing some deep, deep work in our lives. But he can start doing that work today. Maybe it's some kind of insecurity that you've got. You do have this sense of something that God is calling you to do, but you've got some kind of fear, some kind of insecurity, just like Moses did earlier in chapter three, where you're like, I just don't think, like, who am I? Does God want to deal with that? I mean, what, what's your jar? My guess is that you've got something in your life that God wants to get you out of, get, to, get, to get you out of this jar. And how it starts is it starts with prayer, and then it starts with inviting somebody else into the conversation. And what God wants is God wants you out of the jar, and eventually he wants the jar gone. Now, for some of us, we get that in this life. Like, that um, thing that is holding us back is completely gone. But what we definitely know is that in the next life, that sin, that insecurity, whatever, it's been gone. I mean, let's, let's talk about our, our culture for just a second. I got one more jar to break. Let's talk about our culture for just a second. I, wh what are the things that are messing us up as a society as a whole. I mean, certainly you've got, and we're not just talking about this because everybody's talking about it right now, certainly you've got racism that's been around in our country forever. But let's be clear, it's been around in every country forever. Human beings left to our own devices, we turn against each other, oftentimes based on what we look like. It's a part of the human condition. So again, when we are looking at racism, we have to look at it through the lens of the Bible. That what the problem is, is it's sin. Is that brokenness inside of us. And the solution is God fighting that battle in our hearts, in our lives, and in all the manifestations that, 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 that come from us. God dealing with that and us actively participating in it. I'm sure we've made progress. I mean, We've moved on from, from, from so many of the, the systemic stuff with slavery and Jim Crow, all that stuff, but we still got work to do. Don't you want to be in a country that's fully free of that and that this is down there? Don't you want that? Or what, what if I only got one jar for a country? I mean, what, what if this is like hate, like the vitriol that we have? I mean, the, 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 the vitriol that we have towards other people, the constant need to like snipe at people and be snarky towards them. And anything that anybody says that doesn't fit like the, the, the current narrative, we tear them apart for it. Don't you, want, don't, I mean, don't you want to be free from that? The only way that we get there is through a recognition of our sin, through God fighting the battle for us, and for us participating in it. I mean, don't we as a nation, as a, as a people as a whole, I mean, come on. Don't we want to be free from that? The stories that we consume impact the way that we see and the way that we live out our own stories. We have to see that. So let's get saturated in a story that is true. A story of how the problems in the world are problems of sin, of us being underneath the wrong authority, of us giving things authority in our lives that, that, that don't warrant that authority. And us moving towards, because God is fighting the battle for us, towards freedom. And if we think what freedom is, is about not being underneath any authority, well, we, we have, we, we're way off track. What freedom means is freedom doesn't mean not having any authority in your life. Freedom means having the right authority in your life. Do you see that? That's this story. That's what real freedom is. Moving out from underneath the oppressive reign of Pharaoh or the oppressive reign of our insecurities or the oppressive reign of whatever it is. Moving out from underneath that into the 
freedom that comes from being in the loving, grace-filled reign of God. That's the story that the Bible invites us into. And that's the story that we continue to see play out in the Bible, that we see reach its climax in the person of Jesus, who comes fully connected to the Father, fully connected to him, and who then leaves the Holy Spirit with us so that we might be connected to God also. Super practically, what do you do? What do you do? You identify with that jar is, and you own your part in it. Like you repent of, the, of the, the, the sin in your life, the place where you are allowing something to have authority over you that shouldn't. Like you, 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 you own that. You identify it. And then you begin to pray fervently, free me from this. And you don't do it alone. You invite other people in so that they might help you to walk through this. God wants to fight the battle for you, but he wants you walking forward with him. Here's the last little note. I mean, this is who we are as the church, friends. This is who we are. We're just a bunch of people who at some point have realized or are realizing that the narratives that our culture puts forth can't actually hold water. We're people who realize that we can't do it on our own. And we're people who believe that walking in the way of Jesus is the way that leads to abundance, that leads to fullness. That's who we are. And we're people who do that together. People who do that together. So my hope is that this story makes a little bit more sense to you. That you, you feel like you, you, you understand it more. And that through that understanding, that God will use that to crack the jar open, to get you free, and maybe one day to completely wipe out that thing that's holding you back. It'll, it'll happen when we pass on. But sometimes it even happens in this life. But between now and then, may you go forward knowing that the Lord goes with you. May you go one step at a time. And may we as Cornerstone walk together. song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
We're so glad that you joined us in worship today. Listen, so many of you have reached out to ask how you can help with our disaster relief efforts. If you're local, you know that the state of Texas was hit by an unprecedented disaster last week with the snowstorm and the power outage. And you as a church met this with unprecedented generosity. If you wanna to continue to give, you can give at hpmc.org give. But really what we need in this phase is people to serve. So you can check our website at the homepage hbomc.org. Scroll down to see our disaster relief page to find opportunities where you can safely serve in the community to help the rest of our neighbors shovel out from the storm. And now, will you receive this benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. And may he give you peace. Amen. We can't wait to see you in person next week.